Special edition of PFTPM. I'm joined this afternoon by John Brownlee, a lawyer with Holland and Knight who represents the Washington Commanders. And we have some things to discuss about recent developments as it relates to reports, investigations, statements, other matters regarding the team. John, welcome to the program. How are you this afternoon? I'm well, and, and thank you. It's a real honor to be here with you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy. And what I'd like to do is first give the audience a chance to understand who you are, what you do, and how you fit into this broader story that has been around the NFL for months now. Sure. I'm an attorney uh, uh, at Holland and Knight, as you said. I've been here for about 13 years. Before that, I was at the Department of Justice for about uh, 11 years. I was an assistant U.S. attorney in D.C. I was United States attorney um, in the Western District of Virginia for seven years. Um, before that, I was a clerk for a federal judge and then was in the military before, before law school. So uh, our, my role here, along with my firm, is to represent the team. Um, we've helped them primarily on the investigations. We came in um, about 18 months ago uh, and helped uh, the team resolve the settlement with the NFL um, summer of 21. I uh, kind of thought uh, that the representation would be over at that time, um, but then the congressional um, folks came in. We've assisted with that and and really have kind of assisted with all these matters as they have uh, kind of popped up. So generally, we, we work on the investigation side. Our job is to test evidence and see what that evidence says. Um, and uh, so that's been our primary focus and to, and to then advise the team um, and Dan and Tanya as as issues come up. And just again, so folks understand how this works, sure. what are you and your firm currently doing now by way of providing services to the commanders? Yeah, so what you really have now is you have some some kind of two really kind of allegations out there. One focuses on Ms. Johnston, Tiffany Johnson, as you know, Ms. Johnson was a former cheerleader at the team, was also an employee. Um, she came to a roundtable hearing um, in, uh, I think, February of 22. Um, and made an allegation. And so we've assisted the team in, in, in investigating that, assessing the evidence on that. And then there were some other allegations um, advanced by a, a guy named Jason Friedman, who was a former employee as well. <clears throat> and we, along with some other law firms, have assisted in, in, in that piece of it too. So primarily our role is to try to take a look at the evidence and try to assess it so that as these things develop, particularly congressional investigations, as well as Mary Jo White, um, that we can assist with with evaluating the evidence. I mean, that 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 is an important piece of what we do here. And this is where I think some folks may be confused when you say evaluating the evidence. You're not actually investigating yourself. You're looking at information that is being developed by others, or am I wrong? Are you also doing your own separate investigation of the allegations that have sparked the interest of the NFL through Mary Jo White and or the House Oversight Committee? Sure, so let's take Ms. Johnston's allegation, for instance, as you know, <clears throat> she testified that um, at some po point during her employment, I think her initial statement was it was somewhere between 05 and 06, so you're talking 16, 17 years ago, <clears throat> that there was a dinner and at that dinner, she sat next to Dan Snyder and at that time, he placed his hand on her knee, according to her, and that subsequent to that, in that same evening, apparently, that as she left, that he tried to uh, either push her in or pull her into uh, his car. So we've tried to figure out, well, is that true? Uh, and, and so far, all the things that we've been able to develop have shown that it's not true. So first of all, it's, it's shifting timelines, right? It started out as 05 and 06, which, of course, is a 24-month window. And that evidence actually came from one of the congressional attorneys who told us that. Um, so when we then press for more specificity, now it's the spring of 06. Um, first is nobody knew where it happened. Now it's at a restaurant in DC. Um, and so uh, uh, according to her testimony, this was the first time she'd ever talked about this. Then she has a, fake, a Facebook posting that we found a year before in February of 21, where she had made allegations of sexual harassment against two other people who apparently worked at, at the team. Um, she claimed that Mr. Friedman was there. Well, he was placed under oath in question. He had no memory of, of when this occurred or where it occurred. So kind of the corroborating witness couldn't remember much of it either. She claims that, uh, he guess Friedman claims that Mitch Gershwin was there. Well, Mitch says he has no memory of this and he certainly 
had he remembered it, had he been there, had he seen something like this, would have uh, remembered it. And so, uh, of course, Mr. Friedman is represented by the same law firm as as Ms. Johnston. And so, you know, in evaluating just a, I mean, you're an attorney, right? You've worked as a lawyer. You've done these kinds of investigations. Our job, particularly as someone who came from being a federal prosecutor, trying to determine what happened. And uh, then we've also looked at the physical evidence as far as all of Dan's calendars. Again, there's no evidence on his calendars. And these were detailed calendars that somebody else kept about his flight schedule and these things. Uh, there's no evidence that a dinner occurred during this window of time. Uh, we've looked at all the receipts, right? Somebody would have paid for it. We found no evidence that any kind of dinner like this was paid for by the team. So, um, you know, our conclusion, of course, that this just didn't happen because there's no evidence that it did. Um, so these are the kinds of things we've done to help advise the team and and um, feel pretty good about where we are on the on, on at least the, the evidentiary type uh, with the allegations. Has Dana Snyder been interviewed by Mary Jo White on this investigation from Tiffany Johnston or anything else she's investigating? Uh, no, not yet. Um, as you know, uh, the the person of focus is typically interviewed towards the end, if not the last witness. Um, and so uh, we anticipate that sometime uh, she will uh, give him an opportunity to to talk to her. Uh, we hope so. Um, and uh, and then he'll do that. As you know, he did testify before Congress for 11 hours. I was at that deposition. It was, I think it was the longest deposition I've ever been a part of. And he, uh, he sat there and answered every question they had. Uh, in fact, you'll appreciate this. The last thing they said was, you know, Mr. Snyder, we have no more questions, which uh, we thought was significant. He sat there for 11 hours and, and answered every question. So when Ms. White is ready to, uh, excuse me, when Ms. White is ready to uh, talk to him, then we'll set that up. Do you have any idea where that investigation stands, big picture, how long it may be until she concludes her work, asks to interview Daniel Snyder, any type of a timeline? Because there's been nothing that anyone from the NFL has indicated publicly regarding when this is going to wrap up. Right. You know, I really don't know. Um, uh, Ms. White will, will make those judgments. Uh, I do know that I believe that she did the Ross investigation. And so that one, I think, kind of got in front of ours, which may have pushed it out some. But again, I'm speculating on that. But no, I don't know when she'll want to try to set those uh, last interviews or when she will uh, conclude. There are many different ways I can take this, but one of the things I want to get to is the reason that you were offered to us for an interview in the first place. Eric Sutton, a spokesperson for the commanders, mentioned very high up in the email he sent to me a week or so ago that you want to talk about the ESPN article and sure. also this broader, bigger picture, what has been described as a two-year misinformation campaign against right. Daniel Snyder and his ownership of the team. Let's start with the ESPN article. It was two weeks ago today that it came out. What is the team's and or Daniel Snyder's and or your biggest gripe about that very long and detailed article from ESPN? Right. Um, well, it's false. I mean, I think that that the, the general thrust of the article is a fabrication, right? First of all, you start with it's all anonymous sources. Now, I get the fact that anonymous sources can be somewhat valuable in certain kinds of investigations, whether it's government or something like that. But but this is not one of those. And in fact, I was talking to a, a well-respected reporter yesterday who said, you know, his shop would have never allowed something like that out the door. And we had it and we told them, right? We we engaged with the reporters beforehand. They showed us some of the allegations. We told them it wasn't true. We showed them why it wasn't true. And yet they went ahead and reported it anyway. And and here we are now, two weeks after that. And still no corroborating evidence at all for any of the allegations, not an email, not a text message, not a witness comes forward, nothing. And, and again, you're, you're an attorney. And I guess one of the reasons why Eric and I thought it was important to talk to, to you, because you are a lawyer, you sit in a unique position as someone who has that training and has had to be probably sat in, in my shoes at one point where you have represented a client that's been accused of something and you're out there trying to test the evidence and, and despite that, despite what you're finding that would tend to exculpate your client, you see these stories come out. So, so I guess that answer is kind of the first piece of that. I think um, the allegation that, that Dan Snyder was hiring private investigators to snoop on other owners, I mean, that's just patently false. I mean, I, I've represented him with my law firm 
for about 18 months. I've never been <clears throat> asked to do that. My law firm has never uh, hired a private investigator to do that. And you know that if that were to occur, the lawyers would be the ones to do that because that's how you maintain a privilege, right? And so we, we've never been asked to do that. We've never done that. Um, and I've never been in a room where somebody else has been asked to do that. And so um, th there were investigators used very early on uh, in the uh, Indian content farm uh, defamation lawsuit that, that, that they prevailed on. Um, the, the Snyders prevailed on. But since we've been a part of this, we've never been asked to do that. And so I think we sit in a position, quite frankly, that had that been done, we would have known or and or somebody would have brought us the product of some of that. I've never seen that. I've never been part of a conversation where people have talked about any of the other owners in that kind of light or the commissioner. Um, so, you know, I, I just thought that that was something that uh, was was a fabrication. It was false. It was pushed, and it really hurt, right? Because it it tends to try to um, try to break the ownership apart, or to try to create fissures within it, um, based on evidence that's just not true. So well, that's one thing we wanted to certainly discuss. I think they also took some unfair shots against Jason Wright, um, that he somehow wasn't in control, or was was I, I think they kind of insinuated that he was kind of a token which is so unfair, right? And it's that old dog whistle that they pushed. This is an accomplished guy, a graduate of Northwestern, um, consultant at McKinsey, and is doing a great job. And yet there's people that were pushing this narrative. And why? They want to try to undermine the team through negative stories about people like Jason and, and people like the Snyders. So that, that's a couple of the pieces of it, I think. If I heard you correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong at any time throughout the course of this, during the litigation that was filed in India over the yes. defamation claim regarding the reckless and inaccurate attempt to link Daniel Snyder to Jeffrey Epstein, that's where that all came from. There was litigation. Yes. I think Joe Tacopino was involved, among others. I think you said there were investigators involved in that context. That's Can you give us an idea of, of what they were doing in that setting? You know, I wasn't on the team at that time. Um, that was before we joined. So I'm not sure exactly what they did. Um, but I do know that they were retained as part of that piece of the investigation. And then some of their work product was used to brief the NFL on that investigation. Um, and so, so, but I'm not sure exactly who was retained or, or specifically what they did. Um, but I do know that they were retained as, as that part of it. And that was important, right? I mean, these were were really defamatory allegations made against the uh, Dan and, and the Snyder family that were not true. They had every legal right to try to disprove them, which they did. Um, you know, this brings up this other thing. Of, this is one of the things that Congress kind of pushed that there was a shadow investigation. Of course, that wasn't true either. This investigation, this PowerPoint that Congress highlighted as part of this shadow investigation was the PowerPoint that the lawyers at the time who were working for the team used to brief the NFL. Right. And of course, Congress cut, I think there were about 100 slides. They cut 62 out and then said, oh, it's a shadow investigation. So, again, it's it's now that's Congress. And I get that's a political thing. Um, and, and you know, they do political acts. And so that was all part of that. But again, those are the kinds of things when they get spread out there um, can be hurtful. And so we want to try to set the record straight on that. What's your position on whether ESPN has taken sufficient steps to articulate, publish, share the concerns, corrections, clarifications that the team, Daniel Snyder or anyone else from the organization may have about the content of that report from two weeks ago? Right. Well, you know, ESPN kind of basically just took its its great network and handed it over to uh, people who had an ax to grind, had their own <clears throat> motivations and, and said, you can say whatever you want to and we'll print it. So trying to go back to them to try to clean stuff up, I found to be kind of a fool's errand. So what we've done is, is talk to good folks like yourself and, and others and try to answer the questions as, as best we could and kind of lay the record straight on some of these, these more um, uh, crazy allegations that came out of the story. In the letter that was sent by Dan Snyder to his partners, the owners of the other teams last week, there were some buzzwords in there that made me think potential litigation is being contemplated against ESPN. It wasn't threatened. It wasn't sure. expressed. 
but you know the words malice yes. anytime any form of the word malice appears in anything in this context you think uh oh they may get a ticket to a litigation party is right. there any type of litigation threatened or planned against espn because of that story no, I really can't get into that. I would say that <clears throat> those lawsuits are very difficult, as you know, particularly for public officials um, or public, um, not public officials, but, you know, public people. Um, and so the burden is high. New York Times malice is one of the, the toughest things to satisfy in the law. Uh, that being said, I certainly think that these reporters knew what they were publishing was false. Um, and so, um, but, you know, those kinds of decisions will be made at a later time. I think right now, the, the Dan and Tanya really focus on the season. Um, they're trying to win some games and our hope would be that we could try to turn down the noise as best you can. You only have so much control over that and try not to be a distraction to the coaches and the players because you know they're the ones out there on the field uh, doing their darndest to try to win ball games. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to try to turn down the noise, um, try to set the record straight where appropriate um, uh, to talk to folks like yourself who are, who are trained in the law, who understand these things. Um, but at the end of the day, our hope is that the noise can be turned down so the focus can be on the players and the coaches and what's going on on the field. One thing I was trained on very well, always figure out the last possible date on which you can take any action you may be considering. What's your statute of limitations on this? Is it a year? I, I haven't practiced law in long enough that I forget. <laughs> And I don't know you what know, it is in, in, any, in every given jurisdiction. Is it a year? Is it two years? What's the right. deadline if they're going to take action? Right. I'll confess that's not my area of expertise. So uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head what, what that might be. It's something like that. You're, you're probably, I bet your memory is better than mine on that. We'll you mentioned that they, they prevailed in the India litigation. What happened with that? Well, I mean, you know, they, they were able to establish that those things were, in fact, false. He wasn't with Jeffrey Epstein. He wasn't paying off referees. He wasn't doing drugs. I mean, all of that stuff uh, was shown to be false. And again, another other counsel handled that that piece of litigation. Um, but what what was born out of that, I think, was significant in the sense that they brought in attorney, former attorney general Loretta Lynch to assist in that investigation. Um, and um, as a part of that, again, it was somewhat tangential to that, but one of the former minority owners was then, um, according to uh, what, what I saw, there was a Q&A between a member of Congress and, and Commissioner Goodell that was submitted in writing, and, and apparently somewhat born out of that, one of the former minority owners was banned from the, or, or prohibited from ever participating in ownership again. So, um, you know, that was some, some serious stuff and should have never happened. Um, and, um, so, but, but it's damaging, you know, when anything like that happens, it could happen to you, it could happen to me. And, uh, so, uh, that was really that piece of it. Was there a verdict, like a dollars and cents figure that was entered against this company that Daniel Snyder yeah. could then collect on? Yeah. I'm not sure about that. I'll need to check and get back to you on that. Exactly how that, that piece came out. I want to address in the time that we have remaining, and I'm sensitive to your schedule, two-year misinformation campaign to coerce yeah. the sale of the team, well-funded, well-orchestrated, and well-documented smear campaign. Who is behind this? Yeah, you know, you asked the, 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 the best question, and, and I'm not quite sure. I think it's it started probably with the India campaign. I think that was a big part of it. You've got a lot of interesting and odd combinations, and I'll raise a couple of those. You know, first of all, you have Congress who all of a sudden gets involved in this, right? They, they really have no jurisdiction here. And I think some of the Republican members have pointed that out, right? This is the Government Oversight and Reform Committee looking into a private football team. And so why did they do that? What was pushing them? Well, then if you look behind that, there's a law firm called Katz and Banks. I think there's another name partner at it. And Katz and Banks represented um, um, many of the, the cheer, former cheerleaders um, who, who filed lawsuits with the team and settled with the team. And um, they have in many ways kind of become the de facto counsel for the Congress. We sent a letter to Congress uh, several weeks ago and Congress never re re responded, but Katz and Banks did. And, and they were defending congressional action. They were defending people they don't represent. And so you've got this odd combination of this law firm. Uh, and of course, this is the same law firm that brought the allegations against Justice Kavanaugh in his hearings um, uh, and, and represented, I think, uh, one of the, at least the principal accuser. 
And so you've got a lot of this swirling about, I don't know who funds them, if anyone. Um, I don't know what their motivation is. I don't know what they're trying to accomplish. Um, but I know that they're working closely with Congress. I'm not sure what Congress is interested, but when, when one of the members of Congress was questioning uh, the commissioner, what she said was, is why don't you make him sell? And so you've got this kind of orchestrated effort by Congress and a private law firm, and, and obviously somebody's paying the law firm, I think we both know that, um, uh, to try to get him to sell this team. And, um, and so that's our concern here. And, it's, and what is it based on? You know, look at Ms. Johnson's allegation, right? It's from 2005, 16, 17 years ago. We don't know where it happened. We don't know when it happened, right? Think about it in your own life. Let's say someone were to come up and say, you know, Mike, you cheated on a law school test, right? You would first deny it, right? You would say, well, I didn't cheat on my test. Oh, that and presumes would, I didn't cheat on a law school test. I, I bet you did. I I'm bet kidding. you did. But then you would come up and say, well, what test? Well, I don't remember. Well, what year? I don't remember. And then you said, well, well, who else knows about it? Who else saw this? Well, this one guy named Jim saw it. And then you found out that you fired Jim a year ago because he was part of a toxic work environment at your company. Now, are you going to believe that? I mean, and that's kind of what we're facing here. And yet, you know, the, 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 the local paper and some others just take off with it and, and treat it as if it's true and don't ever test that evidence. I don't think any member of the media has ever gone to the Katz and Bake law firm and said, when to, I want to question, I want to talk to, to the complainant and ask her when this occurred and how it occurred and why do you remember it and what evidence do you have, and blah, blah, blah. None of that ever happens. So, you know, we're concerned about that. And uh, again, our role here is to actually look at this objectively. And uh, when you do that, I think what you find out is these things just didn't happen. The Katz and Banks law firm, I've seen mentioned a few times, represents more than 40 former yes. team employees. Have they ever sued or threatened lawsuit on behalf of any of these individuals? I've yet to see, and maybe I'm not remembering, or maybe I'm just not aware of any litigation with that firm representing any of the individuals who they, who they supposedly represent, but haven't taken action on behalf of yet. Right. So there were, there was a group of, of former cheerleaders and employees who settled with the team pretty early on in the process and Katz and Banks represented them. And those were settlements and they had counsel and, and all of that. And, and then there was a separate group that was, and that was gone, that was over. Uh, and then the team was, the investigation by the league was completed. And then the team was punished by uh, Commissioner Goodell with a $10 million fine. And, and Dan was put on the side for a bit. Um, and, and then you had this other group come forward uh, still represented by Katz and Banks, and you had all the congressional piece. So for instance, it's my understanding that Ms. Johnston was provided an opportunity to interview uh, with Beth Wilkinson, and she declined. And so, you know, Beth is a, is a former federal prosecutor. She was an Army JAG attorney, very well accomplished. But, but when she was doing her investigation, this was the opportunity for these folks to come in. And again, the, the commissioner um, uh, guaranteed uh, their confidentiality to the point where he has been highly ridiculed because he hasn't released a report, of course, that doesn't exist, but has been, has been ridiculed because of those decisions he made. But he promised confidentiality, and yet she refused to participate. Then once the settlement is over and the case is done, then she comes forward to Congress with this 16, 17-year-old uh, allegation. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. You mentioned Beth Wilkinson in a favorable light. Do you have any reason whatsoever to question, criticize, undermine in any way the results of her investigation? I, I don't. I think that, um, you, you know, the commissioner wanted a thorough investigation according to his own public testimony. And, and that's why he sought an oral findings as opposed to written. And I think as he explained what he was concerned about was that they would have, you know, witness number one, but describe enough facts that this person could be identified. And there were a, a lot of people who, who, who didn't want to be identified. And now if you want to be, you certainly can be. Some of the women that were part of the report I'm confident have gone public or testified to Congress and, and there have been zero restrictions on what they can say or what answer or what questions they can answer. Um, but, you know, Beth uh, gave us, uh, at least we got the findings. We never, I never met with Beth Wilkinson, but we met with the NFL attorneys who provided us 
uh, some of the substance of her report or her findings. And then from that, we, we resolved the case. And, and they did put out some findings on July 1st. It wasn't a formal report. Um, but the commissioner explained why he didn't want that and didn't do it that way. And um, so I think we have to, you know, respect that. And, and, but again, there is no report to release as far as I understood. I've never seen one. Uh, I've never been briefed on one. What we were told and what we saw were the, the findings that were released on July 1. And the end result of the Wilkinson investigation as unveiled by the league on July 1, 2021, if I'm mm -hmm. understanding what you're telling me correctly, that was negotiated. That was a settlement between the commanders and the league. That wasn't any type of decision by the league that then the commanders could appeal or live with or whatever. This was negotiated resolution with your firm involved to come to the conclusion as to the sanctions that were announced that day. Yeah, well, I mean, it's um, it's not exactly a settlement like you and I might think about it in a, in a commercial setting. Um, the commissioner, in order to go above certain penalties, he, you have to agree to accept them. The, the commissioner's powers are limited in some ways, particularly on the fines and suspensions and the like. And so the commissioner uh, came out with a view of what he felt was appropriate and, and the team uh, after some discussions accepted that. So um, it, it, you know, it's not a freewheeling settlement like you and I would have done in our, in our commercial legal days, but um, it, it is something that you have to kind of accept and, and they did do that. Um, and, you know, with regard to the toxic work environment that was uh, in place uh, more than, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, um, that was, you know, that was real. And, it, and, and our, our uh, investigation found that. And that's why they've taken such measures to try to, try to clean it up. And part of Beth's um, uh, agreement was that there were, she had 10 recommendations and the team accepted all 10 and have implemented them. So that was part of it as well. I know we're up against the window of your availability. I wanna ask you two more questions if we can get to them. One, you mentioned that Dan was put on the side for a bit. That mm -hmm. was the quote that you used. Can you help yes. us understand what that was? Was it a suspension? Is it over? And what's he allowed to do now in your estimation and based on the team's position? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a, a suspension, but he was um, part of that uh, uh, um, agreement or whatever punishment. He did agree to remove himself from the team until November 1. And so, and he did that. Um, and so beyond that, then there are no restrictions. There's no restrictions today. Uh, that being said, as part of that, I think he and Tanya, who, uh, you know, is Tanya's co-owner of the team, decided that she would represent the team at all league meetings and has and, and will continue to do so. I think that that division, uh, her taking that role, um, I think, you know, I, based on what I understand that they've just understood that in light of everything that's happened, it's just in the best interest of the team for her to, to, to represent the team uh, at the meetings and really become uh, that primary owner for the team and be its primary spokesperson uh, at all the league functions. And so she's done that. She's done a great job. I think, uh, you know, there's not a lot of women owners in the NFL and she's taken a role in that and she's got some strong relationships there. Um, and I think she's enjoying it. And um, so uh, I hope I answered your questions, but yeah, that's, that was part of that uh, agreement settlement, whatever uh, back in 2021. Quick follow. And then I have one more after that. Yeah, of course. The, the, the reason I ask is from time to time, there'll be a flare up on what his status is. The league says right. he's still on restrictions. Somebody from the team says he isn't. And it just feels like right. a constantly moving target as to what he currently is allowed to do, what he's not allowed to do, when that ends, if that ends. That's what a lot right. of people are confused by. Yeah, well, I'm, I, it, it ended November 1st. Um, now, he could go to all the games, and I think he, he did go to the games. Um, even during that time period, but there were other restrictions as far as going out to the facility and those kinds of things that he didn't do um, because of that sanction that was imposed by the NFL. Um, and, and of course, in according, and it was also the $10 million fine and then the other pieces of it as well. Um, but once that came and went, once November 1st came and went, um, he was free to do whatever he wanted to do. Um, there were no restrictions. Um, that being said, I still think that they agreed because of everything that was going on, that it was in the best interest of the team for him not to do certain things. And he's just not done it, but it's been by his own choice. 
um, and, and obviously in consultation with Tanya, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, listen, these are two people that love this team, that love the league. They've been a part of it for a long time. They love the community. They want to win. Um, and, and yet he recognizes that with, with everything that goes on, he uh, can be a distraction to the players and the owners. And he doesn't want that because he cares for them too much. And so he has pulled back and, um, and he's, but he's done that voluntarily. Last one, and this isn't the way that lawyers say last one, which means there's going to be more than one more. Exactly. The emails that were sent by John Gruden to Bruce Allen when he was with the commanders, the emails that resulted in Gruden resigning as coach of the Raiders and that it sparked right. litigation between Gruden, the league, and Roger Goodell. Have you yes. investigated and or do you know who gave those emails to the New York Times and or the Wall Street Journal? Right. I do not. Other than this, I, I, I know it wasn't us. Um, I saw those emails obviously very early in this process um, and they were horrific. Um, the communications between uh, the coach and, and, and um, Bruce Allen were, were horrible. And I know D. Smith um, and I, he was a federal prosecutor in the office in DC. Um, uh, I think we, we had a, a short crossover period and, and I'm friends with him and he's an extraordinary person. He's a great public servant. Uh, you know, this is a guy who graduated from the top law schools in the country that could have gone and made so much money in the private sector. And instead, he elected to go be a federal prosecutor and try to make the, the city of Washington safer and better. And so for these two guys to, to make uh, to, to speak ill of him in the way that they did was was just it was shocking. And so uh, and quite disappointing. And um, and he deserves so much better than that. So, you know, it's a good thing they're both out of, of the league. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that people would never do that again, but with regard to the leaking of that, I have no idea. Um, but I know we didn't do it. And I can tell you this, that when this case was settled on July one, it was a, it was, it was a, it was a relief that it was done. The punishment was the punishment. We accepted the punishment and it was time to turn to the leaf and go forward. And they really have. And so the notion that somehow somebody on this team would have gone back and, and leaked that and brought all this back up is, is crazy. Um, I don't know who did it. I'd love to know, but um, it caused a lot of damage. I can tell you that. And I'm going to violate my rule just because I want to be 100% clear. When you say us and we, you're not just saying the law firm of Holland and Knight. You're saying the firm, the commanders, Daniel Snyder, Tanya Snyder, nobody connected with the team leaked this to the media. I, I have zero evidence that anyone connected with the team did this. Zero. Um, and obviously our law firm didn't, but but I, I, I don't believe Dan or Tanya did. I don't believe Jason did. I don't believe anyone did. Uh, for the team, it would have been so against its interest to do that, as you can tell. Um, and um, so, uh, again, I don't know who did. I don't know who all, I don't know everyone who had access to it, um, but um, I know that the team didn't do it. Well, John, I could talk to you for another hour or two about this, but I will let you sure. get back to more important things than dealing with me. We thank you for your time. Maybe we'll do this again at some point. And uh, I wish you all the best going forward. And thanks for giving me so much time to help us understand this better. Well, I'm grateful for your time and I wish you the best of luck. And thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to meet you. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.